We are ready to begin. Uh, everybody take a seat. Yeah. So uh, let's have some, some uh, opening remarks uh, first from committee chairs. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to Chess uh, 2017. Uh, we are the uh, program co-chairs of uh, this year, uh, Naomi Homa and Rian Fisher. So it's our great pleasure uh, to uh, see you and uh, introduce uh, these opening remarks. Okay, so get started. So, uh, okay, let me briefly explain our review process first. So we had uh, 130 submissions, and for each paper has reviewed uh, by four reviewers, and uh, five reviews if the uh, PC members are co-authored. So in total, we had uh, 559 reviews uh, by uh, 50 PC members and 240 external reviewers. We really appreciate uh, for their uh, sincere efforts for the review process. And we did uh, the review uh, during uh, 2.5 months uh, with the uh, rebuttal phase. And finally, we selected the very excellent uh, papers, 33 excellent papers. So acceptance rate at 25%. Yeah. Um, we have one best paper. It's, uh, the title is Nanofocused X-ray beam to reprogram secure circuits. The paper will be presented today after the invited talk. It's, I think, 3 p.m. And, well, I'll read the names tonight at the RAMP session where the ceremony takes place. We have 11 technical sessions, one wider talk about hardware security, foundry perspective, by Shi Lian Lu from TSMC. We have a poster session. It is chaired by Oscar Riparath, and it will take place at the coffee breaks tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. These are extended coffee breaks. They are 45 minutes long, so you will have plenty of time to look at the posters. Yesterday, we already had two tutorials by Tim Gunesu on post cryptography for embedded systems and by Colin O'Flynn, such and live. If you want to download the proceedings, just go to the chess page and scroll down. Can you see that actually? Well, if you scroll down, you will see a, a link of uh, Springer. This link will bring you to the, to the page of Springer and you can download the proceedings. You can download the single chapters and you can also download the whole proceedings in one PDF. Please don't do it now because if everybody enters this page now then it will break down. Sometimes you will get an, an error message. I've seen it. Um, then just try, try it later. This link will be active until mid of October so if you you have plenty of time to download the proceedings, even if you are back at home. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, this is a program outline, as you may already know. So uh, we have three days, and today we have four technical sessions and uh, invited talks. And after the invited talks, we, uh, we, had a talk, uh, we have a talk for the best paper hours. And also we have a lamp session chaired by DJ Bernstein and Tanya Lang. And tomorrow uh, we have a three technical session and poster session during the longer coffee break, as Willan said, and discussion and dinner. And Thursday, so we also had uh, have a four technical session and poster sessions during longer uh, coffee break. So I, we hope to enjoy this program. Okay. Hi, uh, so uh, <coughs> uh, 
Um, I'm Bo-Yan Yang, and this is uh, Chen-Mo Cheng. Uh, we are the general co-chairs, and uh, a few things uh, that you might find useful. Uh, keep your uh, badges for uh, your meals and breaks, and, and uh, would the speakers please uh, talk to your session chairs. Uh, you you uh, would please sign release forms so that uh, we are doing live web broadcast, and uh, uh, upload your uh, uh, slides uh, in the break prior to your talk. And we uh, would ask that we support our sponsors by uh, going to see our exhibits in the VIP room one on the fourth floor. That's where the tutorial was. And most of you already knew where the Wi-Fi was, and we tell you again. And so uh, we have uh, sold almost every seat in this in this room, basically, so uh, don't take up more than one seat. Uh, if uh, uh, there's an em empty spot, somebody might come in and sit on it. Uh, so uh, let let's have a round of thanks uh, for our sponsors uh, and our <coughs> diamond sponsor and Rainbus Cryptography. And our platinum and gold sponsors, uh, Riscure. <laughs> and, and gold sponsor, NXP. <laughs> and our uh, great friendly sponsors, and I mean in, in alphabetical order. Alpha North, e -Short, IKV, Infineon, New AE, OSR, and Secure IC. And we also thank Intel for providing some student travel grants, and also uh, Springer and Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company for some donations. And so uh, dinner tonight is at uh, uh, nine, uh, sorry, 1930. Uh, so the ROM session will begin uh, one hour after that, and submissions are accepted until 11 o'clock, but uh, can be updated until 16 o'clock. And the excursion leaves tomorrow at uh, four, uh, 14.35 from the front door and uh, departs back to the region at uh, 17.45 from the Palace Museum. We will put up uh, notices uh, for bus group assignments and the banquet is at 7 o'clock p.m., 19 o'clock Wednesday. And the meals this afternoon is at the Brasserie restaurant uh, on the first floor. And again, we are nearly sold out on seats. And those who don't have uh, uh, lunch coupons for today, uh, please assemble at the reception, uh, like uh, we are eating at a separate place. Uh, we only need meal coupons for the brasserie this today's lunch and tomorrow's banquet. The other days just come with your badge. And those for special food needs uh, for the banquet, please grab a place card at the reception. I mean, otherwise you might serve the wrong food. Uh, the lunch is tomorrow and the day after that will be served right outside this ballroom in, in a cafe. So um, I think this uh, is, we are ready to begin. Enjoy just 2017.
Ah, yeah, because it's inside. Okay. I think. Okay. All right. Good morning. Um, my name is Benedict. I'm happy to chair the first session on side channel analysis. And while the hardware is getting ready, I'll introduce the first speaker. And that will be Melissa Rossi, I believe. And um, she's going to speak about a side channel assisted crypt analytic attack against QC bits. And we're almost there. We have already an image on the screen here. Can you put it on the beamer? We're getting there, we're getting there. Do we, have a, do we have a clip on mic? Do you have a mic? Hello? Works. Works. Right, we have a microphone, we have an image, okay. we have a speaker. <laughs> Go ahead, the floor is yours. So hi, I'm Melissa. I'm going to present a side channel assisted cryptanalytic attack against QuickBits. It's um, a key recovery attack using a side channel to recover the key from uh, an algorithm called QuickBits. It's a quantum algorithm, code-based algorithm. So to work with Mike Amberg, Michael Hutcher, and others. So um, quantum computers they threaten the mathematical problems on which public key uh, algorithms are currently based. And that's why there were some uh, calls for standardization and transition to quantum public algorithms in the near future. They have been called from NIST and also um, European for quantum security is to uh, problem with the different from uh, factorization and one possible problem is correcting so, uh, the uh, code base uh, on which done in the so inner code were first used for telecommunications uh, it was used for sending data from one person to another without any crypto using a binary linear code, which is a linear subspace of F2 to the N. And so it was used, uh, if Alice wants to send the data, then she does a linear expansion, and it's just adding redundancy in her data, and then she creates a code word. And then she sends it into a noisy channel, and it becomes a noisy code word. And then Bob um, can decode thanks to the redundancy, and get the data back. So this was for telecommunications. And then, Michaelis in, in 1978 had the idea to use this system for creating a public key algorithm. So the idea is that the public key is a way to create the code words, but the secret key is some hidden structure of the code, and then it's a way to remove the, her the errors. So first, Alice does the same for us telecommunications. She does a linear expansion to create the word. And instead of um, sending it into a noisy channel, she intentionally adds some random errors. And the noisy code word becomes the ciphertext. This whole process is the encryption using the public key. And it's based on the fact that uh, without knowing any structure of the code, the code looks like a random code, a random code, random linear code, and then it's hard to remove the errors. And uh, Bob knows some hidden structure of the code, and then he's able to decode and remove the errors. So that's the Michaelis process. So a uh, code is just uh, sub linear subspace, so there are several possibilities for choosing an appropriate code. Uh, the original one was using binary of a code, and uh, it's still considered as secure today because there 
hasn't been any structural attack on this. But the problem with this is that the keys were quite large, so there were some work to, re to reduce the key sizes and some other propositions for the codes, but lots of them were broken. And then uh, in 2013, there were QC MDPC code. Uh, they were proposed by Mizoski et al. And now there is an attack. Maybe it's a little early to say that it's secure, but it looks like a great candidate. And now, um, the target of the attack is called QuickBits. Uh, it's a QC MDPC algorithm, a code based algorithm. So it has been presented by Tung Shu last year in chess. Uh, it's a very fast implementation with small key sizes. And uh, they were work to, pr to protect it against side channels and particularly timing attacks. It's a constant time implementation. So uh, we decided to look at side channel attacks, but not uh, timing attack and more uh, differential power analysis. So it has two sets of parameters, 80 bits of security and 128 bits of security. Uh, here are the parameters. So the secret key is H, which is the concatenation of two matrices, H0 and H1. For example, it's something like that in small dimension. So QC MDPC means quasi-cyclic moderate density parity check. So it's, it's saying that H0 and H1 are circulant, and so R is the size of the matrices. So also H0 and H1 are, have very sparse rows. So only W over two ones, which is uh, for, for example, 80 bits of security, it's 45 ones per row. And then the code words are uh, in the right null space of H. So actually, H is completely describing the structure of the code. It's the secret structure. And uh, so from now on, I'll use 80-bit uh, uh, security parameters. So instead of using W over 2, I'll use 45. And then the public key, it's a matrix P, which is a weaker information than H. It's H1 minus 1 times H0. So it's useful to create code words, but it's not enough to, reco to recover and decode. And P is circulant too, and it's dense. And uh, H and P are circulant, so that's useful for storage and computation. So here is our attacker model. We want to know the secret matrix H, which is H0 and H1. And we already know the public key P. And with some, we know some ciphertext previously sent and the corresponding power traces. So uh, we decided to look at the decoding because it's the only part where the secret key is used. And for QC MDPC, the decoding algorithm is called bit flipping. It's a probabilistic algorithm that, in a succession of steps, uh, removes the errors. And uh, we were only interested in the second step, which is the multiplication between the secret matrix H and the ciphertext. It's called the syndrome computation. So here is uh, our contribution. We present a new classical key recovery attack, and we recover H0, which is both H, uh, H which is both H0 and H1. So first, we don't know any of them. Then we do some differential power analysis, and then we get to recover some, uh, we narrow down some position to the non-zero elements of the first row. And since it's circulant, it's it translates. And then with the mathematical system, we are able to recover the whole first matrix, H0. And with that, thanks to the relationship between the public key and the private key, we are able to recover H1. And so finally, we get all the secret key. And after, I'll present a simple but effective quantum measure. So first, let's look at the differential power analysis. So we targeted the syndrome computation, which is inside the bit flipping. It's the multiplication between H and the ciphertext. And in the implementation, the ciphertext is padded with zeros. So actually, we only 
will get information about H0 times C and no, no information about H1. Let's recall that H0 is a sparse and circulant matrix. It is uniquely defined by X0 to X44, which are the unknown indices of the non-zero element of the first row. So if we co recover those indices, it means that we have recovered the whole matrix H0. So for example, in small dimension, X0 could be two and X1 could be five. And if we know X, uh, two and five, we are able to uh, rebuild the whole matrix H0. And uh, so we note, uh, we denote by small H0, the first row of uh, capital S0. So to target the syndrome computation, we looked uh, how it was done uh, in the implementation. So here, the matrix H0 is decomposed as a sum of 45 rotation matrices. So it's a sum of matrices with only one one on the first row, and they are circulant. And then uh, it's multiplied by the ciphertext. So it's done um, by matrix by matrix by computing the rotated ciphertext. And then the final value of the multiplication is the XOR of all the rotated ciphertext. So we decided. Uh, to target this intermediate value, so the rotated ciphertext, by differential power analysis. And we were hoping that uh, this value would leak, and a function of the identity of this value would leak. So we decided to pour this code into a platform, which is the Chipospor Light. It was presented yesterday at, uh, by Colin O'Flynn during the tutorial. Uh, so we used the original code. And we poured it into this platform. Well, uh, just the, syndrome, the decoding, the beginning of the decoding algorithm with random inputs. And uh, it's, the advantage is that it's easy to use. It has an onboard power measurement. And so it's, uh, it can be easily reproducible with this device. So the target of our attack was uh, the computation of the rotation, rotated ciphertext and particularly the storing into local memory of this value. And here is the power trace of a rotation computation. So since it's constant time, it's always the same shape. And even if it's a rotation of zero, it's the same trace. So we targeted at the end of this trace, the storage. And if we zoom in this storage, we get uh, this. Uh, since our platform is an 8-bit platform and that uh, the, in the, the indices, no, the um, integers in the algorithm are 64, bit, 64 bits, then uh, it's eight steps to, to manipulate each 64-bit chunk. Here are the eight steps. So we did a, diff a classical differential power analysis on this. And here is the result. So it here is the trace of the maximum difference of means using 500 traces over all possible values for the secret key index. So there is a significant difference uh, observed around the correct index, which is 2000. But if we zoom in, we see that the peak always starts on a multiple of 64. So uh, it's not enough information because for each index, we would have 64 uh, possibilities. So we decided to get more information, and for that, we looked at the leak in time. And in time, so here is the, the leak in time, it, it happens in different locations. For example, here it happens at the sixth location, and here it happens at the seventh location. So with this, it's, re it's uh, related to the secret key also. So we were able to uh, create two leakage models. The first one is... Uh, using the, um, the key index when the leak starts. So it's uh, yi, and it's related to the secret key by the first equation. And then the, le the second leakage model is using the location in time when the, the leak uh, happens, and so it's also related to the secret key by the second equation. If we combine those two models, we have only eight possible values for the secret key index xi. It, it's in a certain interval written here. And in our example, uh, we measure those two values. And therefore, we can deduce that the secret index in, is in this interval, so 1993 and 2000. And actually, it was 2000. 
So with that, if we do that in, for each secret key index, we will have some different int interval. And here is the knowledge we get after the differential power analysis. So here is the small h0, which is the first row of the capital H0, which is the big matrix. So we have some different intervals where we know that there is a one somewhere, but we don't know exactly where. And there are some location where there's zero, and we, we are sure of that. Sometimes the interval overlap, but if it's the case, then they are completely uh, superposed because the intervals start, always start at a multiple of h plus one. So if two intervals in, uh, superpose, then we know that there are two ones in this interval. So we also know ex the exact number of ones we get in each interval. And so let beta be the number of intervals. So we decided to have um, variable alpha for the size of the intervals, because our guess was that uh, in our platform, since it was an 8-bit platform, we get alpha equals 8. And for example, for other platforms with other architecture, alpha would be larger. Since everything is linear, it's hard to make, to make alpha very small. So let alpha be, the, the alpha represents the DPA uh, attack accuracy. So now uh, we say that if we get this information, then we get the whole secret key. So both H0 and H1. So let's re recover them. So let's recall that there is a relation between the public key and the secret key, which is uh, this one. And then uh, we can set up a system, uh, which is here, the second equation. And then, um, so Q is a big matrix which is dense and completely known. A small h0 is sparse and partially known with those intervals I presented. And then small h1 is completely unknown and it's sparse. So we will use all the information to, to solve this system and recover H0 and H1. Here is the system. Uh, so we see that um, the, there are some zones, Z0, which are the intervals where we don't know exactly where the ones are. And uh, the gray zones are the zero zones. And so uh, the zero zone will be multiplied by the gray zone in Q. And so we can remove them. Here, are, here is the new system. And so we have a smaller H0. And then we, the DPA, we know exactly the number of value of uh, each, uh, the number of one in each interval. So we are able to add some uh, parity equations at the bottom of Q prime, which gives the uh, parity of each interval, the, par the parity of the number of ones in each interval. It's just to use more uh, information and get more equations. And then we would like to solve this system, but the right part uh, is unknown. So we use the fact that H1 is extremely sparse. Its entries are zero with very high probability, more than 99%. So we decided to create a square system of equation by randomly selecting entries from H1 and guessing that they are zeros. Just saying that they are zeros and we keep the corresponding rows in Q prime. Here is the system we get. So this system, this system is correct with a certain probability P. Let's assume this system is correct. Then we are able to solve it and the solution will have the right Hamming weight and so we will be able to recover the first row H0 and then the whole matrix H0 and then with the relationship between the public key and the private key, recover the H1. So now, if the system is not correct, if we guessed the wrong, uh, the wrong zeros, then um, we will be able to solve it, but the solution won't have the right Hamming weight. And so we will notice that and try again and guess some other zeros, do this step again. So we will do this step again until we get the right solution. Well, the solution with the right Hamming weight. And so the number of attempts we need to do is one over, the average number is one over the probability. So here is the, the number of attempts. So for 80 bits of security in our system, 
So alpha, the size of the intervals, is equal to 8. Then there are 22, uh, 22 attempts. And then it gets bigger with uh, alpha getting bigger, bigger. And also it gets bigger with uh, 128 bits of security. Here is the total complexity in terms of multiplications. So it's the number of attempts time the um, complexity of a system solving. So for our device, where alpha equals 8, uh, we have this complexity. So we did some experimental results uh, on Sage. And uh, for alpha equals 8, so for our system, um, we had the solution quite fast. Uh, it's a matter of seconds. Then for 16, 16, alpha equals 16, it's a little longer. It's a matter of minutes. For 32, it starts to get large. Uh, but it's still doable with parallelization. And for 64, it's very hard. Uh, so the code is available in the link here. So now I'll present uh, a simple but effective countermeasure against this attack. The idea was, uh, was to mask the intermediate values, but we decided to mask with a special mask, which is actually to mask it with a code word. So a random code word. Then uh, the advantage of this masking is that there is no unmasking needed. And so uh, since it's multiplied by the parity check matrix H, uh, it's, um, it's completely removed. And so no unmasking needed. So then uh, the, the countermeasure worked and it prevented our attack. Finally, uh, so QuickBits is a good post-quantum candidate. It has some small key sizes and it's very efficient. And so as we saw, uh, it's quite easy to protect against DPA. Well, our protection only protects the syndrome computation, but uh, the idea can be used for other parts. And it would be an inter interesting pers uh, perspective to do a masking of this scheme. Uh, there, is, there are some drawbacks like the fact that the key, the secret key is very sparse. And so uh, if we get a little bit of information, thanks to the redundancy, we can get the whole secret key. And particularly with DPA, that's what we can do. And so it's a, it's a weakness. And then there is another drawback, which is the fact that uh, the failure rate of the decoding algorithm uh, is non-negligible. And so sometimes when it fails, there has been an attack uh, by Guo et al. in IGCrypt 2016, and the key can be recovered when the system fails. So the protection would be to use it as an ephemeral uh, key exchange and not as an exchange of messages. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for the talk. Um, we have time for questions. I can't see you. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right, I start. So, um, I'm not sure. I think you answered my question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So, it's um, it, the decoding is probabilistic, right? Yes. It uh, yes, may it fail. Is. So. Is, is, that, is that relevant for the DPA part of the attack? Like, if you have uh, traces of decodings that fail, does that hinder the attack? We didn't use that. We only used the syndrome uh, computation, which is at the beginning of the decoding algorithm. So it's just the beginning of the algorithm. And that part never fails? N uh, it, it, it's independent of the fact that it fails or not. It's, it's independent of that okay. The attack. OK. Anyone now? Oh, okay, I'll ask another question. Um, I can do this the whole morning, huh? <laughs> so, um, the, the noisiness of the DPA result is very important. That's why you have this alpha, right? That uh, indicates kind of the, the uncertainty. Uh, yeah, it depends on that and also on the um, architecture of the... Well, it depends on a lot of things, but yes, yeah. on the so, noise also. Um, and as, as we see, if, if the alpha grows, the attack at some point becomes yes. impractical, right? Yes. So an alternative countermeasure would be to make sure that this alpha is large enough, so the DPA is noisy enough? 
Yes, that could be a solution, like using a 64-bit platform when uh, then the leak would be smaller and so then it would be harder. Okay, good. Now anyone? <laughs> uh, yes. <one. laughs> Uh, thanks, thanks for your presentation. And uh, I have one question. So I'm not sure whether this uh, this attack will have some uh, some some concerns when diff the key are uh, different because uh, now you build the uh, use the DPA to attack the uh, key byte by byte, right? Because the it's the eight bit CPU, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if, for example, if the key is all zero, then you will net you you will never get uh, anything from the peak for the peak. So it seems if the key have more ones, then uh, you will get a higher uh, SNR. I mean, you will use uh, less traces to retrieve the key. Um, no, if the, keys, the key have more ones, if the key has a larger humming weight, then it would be a countermeasure for this attack because uh, it's harder to get uh, the key. And, uh, um, yeah, but the problem is that the humming weight of the of the first row is defined by the parameters that were uh, that were proposed by the original paper, and so I don't know if there are studies to uh, to say that to say that those parameters are optimal. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, so we use those parameters to be sure that it's the original ones. We didn't increase the number of ones of the first row. Time for one more question. No, everything was clear. Thanks again. Okay, second speaker. Speaker, speaker, speaker. There. Coming. Okay, second presentation in this session um, is about improved blind side channel analysis by exploitation of joint distributions of leakages. And uh, the talk will be given by Leo Reno. Please. Thank you very much for the presentation, the introduction. Uh, so my name is uh, Leo Reno. I'm working with uh, Christophe Clavier. And today I'm going to talk about uh, an improved blind side channel analysis by exploitation of joint distribution of leakages. So first, I'm going to go through a little recap of uh, the common side channel attacks that uh, already, uh, everyone already know. Uh, and then I'm going to present uh, joint distributions and a tool that is called uh, the maximum of likelihood criterion. Uh, and then I'm going to present an extension uh, to mask implementation of these joint distributions, and I'm going to con conclude. OK, so um, the common side channel attacks that uh, I'm talking about are the DPA, the CPA, and the MIA. Uh, and they share one common thing, is that uh, we need to know the plain text or the cipher text. And for every guess of the, of the subkey, we can uh, compute an internal state. And then, uh, by observing the leakage, uh, cor correlate in some way uh, the leakage and uh, the data that was predicted. So we need, uh, we need the plain text. And uh, in some cases, we are not able to get it, or it is not exploitable. In this example, the EMV uh, session key derivation, the plain text is just a counter on two bytes, so 
uh, it does not vary in, uh, enough. And as uh, ciphertext is a session key, it is not available. So uh, an idea to attack this uh, was to not only uh, look at the leakage on uh, the internal set that was predicted before, like uh, the output of the S-box, that is uh, Y in this uh, figure, but also to get information about the plain text that we do not have anymore by looking at the leakage on, uh, on him here, uh, the input of the, of the other key. So that's uh, the idea of joint distributions uh, here. And uh, in order to explain it, uh, let's first recall that the leakage is closely linked to uh, the aiming weight of the data. So the joint distributions are uh, built by counting the couples of aiming weight on M and Y, so the input of the Adron key and the output of the S-box, uh, typically. And uh, it gives this. So we clearly see he, uh, here that uh, those two distributions are different. So uh, we will be able to select the key afterwards to distinguish them. And as they are and uh, it's, uh, it's possible because all uh, the distributions are different for every key. Okay, so we can discriminate it. Um, what are the, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, this kind of attack uh, com compared to the previous one? Uh, now, we can't put the old trace in the attack. We need to locate the point of interest um, of M and Y, uh, and we we have only uh, to get those leakages. And uh, as I said before, we are the joint distributions are in the amine weight uh, field, so we have to uh, infer amine weights from the leakages. But on the bright side, uh, we do not have to to ha we do not have the to take the plain text anymore to attack. And the direct effect of uh, this is that we can attack on every round. Uh, the basic steps of uh, these attacks are first to locate the point of interest uh, to get the leakages, then infer aiming weight of uh, those leakages, then build the, um, the joint distribution for each key, and then uh, to apply a distinguisher to get uh, the key whose distributions best fits uh, the observations of the amine weights. Okay, so there are two main contributors in, uh, in this field. The first one was uh, Yanis Lange, who introduced the joint distributions ID. Um, and when he presented the attack, he used the so-called slice method in order to infer the amine weights. And then he used distances between uh, the experimental histogram and the distributions, uh, the joint distributions. A second one was uh, Hélène Le Boudère that you, uh, introduced the maximum of likelihood criterion uh, to replace the use of distances between histograms. And our contribution is uh, that we present a new way of inferring amine weights uh, without key knowledge. Uh, that is called the variance method. We try to improve the use of joint distributions in some way that I will present uh, later, and we extend it to masked implementations. In order to, further, uh, to um, present the variance method afterwards, I will first present the slice method. Um, it assumes a linear model of conception. So, if we sort the leakages by, uh, by, con uh, by SND order of consumption, we can make correspond the lowest ones uh, to the amine weight zero, and then uh, make correspond another part of these leakages uh, that are just uh, below them to the amine weight one and extra uh, onto the top of it. Um, property of this, uh, 
of this method is that, is that uh, we get integral value of aiming weight. Now we present uh, the variance method, uh, that is a new way of uh, inferring aiming weights. We still assume that it's a linear, model, uh, linear uh, consumption model. And our goal is to get the alpha and the beta of, uh, the, of the model in order to infer the aiming weight of the data. So first we express the variance of the leakage like this. And we get this uh, for 8 bits data. Uh, and you can see that there is a relation between the variance of the leakage, the variance of the noise, and the alpha. So as we are looking for the alpha, we have to get the variance of the leakage and the, the variance of the noise. And uh, those two informations can be retrieved by uh, a simple, uh, simply by looking to a variance uh, trace or a standard devi deviation trace. The variance of the leakage is simply found at the point of interest that we are looking for. And the variance of the noise um, can be estimated as a low value of, uh, of variance, typically because uh, the variance of the noise is the variance on the leakages that are independent from the data. Okay, so now we can compute alpha and then beta, and we inverse the function of, uh, of consumption and we get uh, the aiming weight. And now we get the aiming weight, but in uh, real values. Okay, now uh, the maximum of likelihood criterion. Uh, so we assume that we get noisy observations, uh, no, uh, we infer aiming weights from the leakages, so we get noisy, uh, noisy observations, uh, HM and HY, that are the, the aiming weights of on, on M and Y, but noisy. And the goal is to compute the probability of the key given this, op this op observation. Thanks to Bai, we can express it uh, like the second line here. Um, as, uh, and it's a um, function of the probab probability of the observation given k times the probability, uh, the prior probability of the key. So it's like an iterative way of computing the probability of k given an observation, then another observation, and so on. So now we have to express the probability of the observation knowing k. And this can be done with the law of total probability. And we get two terms. The right terms, probabi probability of uh, h uh, star extra, is simply uh, the values in the joint distributions. But, uh, and the left term here is the probability of the noise. OK, so just with the joint distributions, the prior probability of k and the probability of the noise, we can get uh, the probability of k given an observation. Okay, so what about the improvement that we made uh, on joint distributions? Uh, prior works only uh, thought about looking to m and y, and uh, we showed that using more variables and uh, creating the joint distribution that uh, uh, that correspond and applying um, the maximum of likelihood criterion and adapting it to more variables uh, make the attack more efficient. So, uh, in fact, uh, just M is, uh, is mandatory into the variables that we are using. Uh, and then you can imagine all the other combinations of the variables used afterwards, but that do not uh, involve the other keys. So we can, uh, we can make uh, m, x, y attacks, x being the output of the, of the Hadron key, for example, or using other variables that are, that are in the mix columns. And a particular attack is uh, m, x attack, uh, because it do not uh, retrieve the whole key, it just retrieves the aiming weight of the key. Uh, so you might think it's not, it's not very good, but 
the attack is very efficient as the, there is only nine distributions and they are very uh, different as you can see on those two figures. And we know that uh, if we can get all the amine weights of the extended key bytes, we can get the key. And as the joint distribution works on every round, uh, it is possible to attack on every round on every key byte. So this is very interesting, in fact. So here are some re simulation results um, to show that uh, using more variables uh, add information and make the, the attack more efficient. Uh, on the left, this is uh, the rank of the correct key uh, function to the number of observations. And in a plain line, the former attack uh, MY for different level of noises. And uh, in dotted lines, uh, we don't really see, yes, see, uh, we see. Um, it shows that uh, at uh, some level of noises, we, we do uh, make the attack better. For example, the two red lines here. And on the right, um, this is the rank of the humming weight of the correct key, uh, function to the number of observations. And we see that uh, we, we need just a couple of uh, hundreds of traces to get the right humming weight. So it's very efficient. And something that was not done in the work, uh, works before uh, was to do experimental uh, attacks. So we made one on uh, Narduino Uno 8-bit, and we, we, get, we got 1,000 uh, uh, traces. And we let the attack. Uh, so the first two lines are the former attack with the distances. And we use the slice method in order to get uh, the amine weights. The third line is uh, the same method to get the amine weights, but using the maximum of likelihood criterion. So we, we do observe that the maximum of likelihood criterion is better. And then we also use the variance method uh, in order to get the, the amine weights and we use the maximum of likelihood, and we show that our method of the, of the variance to get uh, amine weights uh, is, is, uh, is, uh, is more efficient. Then we try to extend it to masked implementations, and we observe that um, we can attack all the masked implementations as long as m, that is mandatory, and at least one other variable. Uh, in fact, the variable that we are using in the joint distributions are masked with the same mask. So if we make a M Y attack, M and Y must be masked with the same mask. Uh, so in order to do those attacks, we have to build new joint distributions. And uh, you can see that those distributions are much more alike than before, so uh, the attack is much more harder uh, is harder to do, but the joint distributions are still uh, all different, so it's still feasible. And a very uh, very particular uh, attack is also the MX attack because uh, as the set of M and X uh, and the set M XOR a mask and X XOR a mask are the same. The joint distribution of their amine weight is the same, are the same, and uh, so the attack is not impact. You can attack on M X uh, bla uh, masked or not masked, but if it's masked with the same mask, you can attack with just 100 traces. Uh, 100 traces. So here are some. Uh, Boolean masking schemes, and uh, just to, to, to make it simple, here uh, on this scheme, M, X, and Y are masked with the same mask, so we can imagine all those trees, uh, three um, attacks. But on the second, uh, X is not masked with the same mask than M and Y, so we can only make a M, Y attack. So, uh, 
a recommendation that we do is to, to use a full uh, all mask independence on at least those three variables, but in fact, with all the other variables uh, used in the mix column, for example. Uh, here are some re simulation results about uh, attacking a masked implementation. So on blu uh, in blue, uh, MY attack, and in red, uh, MXY attack. And we see that uh, even if it uh, requires a lot more traces than in unmasked implementation, we can still get the key. Okay, so to conclude, um, we, sh we presented a new method to infer arming waste uh, without key knowledge, uh, known as the, as the variance method. We used the joint distributions uh, differently than before. We used other variables. Um, we also uh, were very interesting in, interested in the use of MX attacks, as it uh, works uh, very well on masked implementations. Uh, so we extended the, the, the common joint distributions to some masked implementations. But in the future works, uh, maybe we could attack uh, the last scheme that I presented, where all the masks are, dif are different. Um, we could also extend it to extend the attack to other uh, consumption model. And uh, we might have to identify protocol that uh, where only uh, those kind of attacks uh, are possible. So thank you for uh, your attention. Thanks, Leo. There's time for questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one is, do you think that we can improve the attack by considering a tuple of intermediate results instead of pairs? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, may maybe it wasn't... Uh very well explained, but uh, the question is, can we attack on three points of interest at the same time, for example? No, no, oh. ah, no I didn't. not exactly, no. Uh, instead of considering two intermediate results, for instance, uh, in, your, in your attack uh, against uh, protected implementations, you attack uh, the message uh, XOR with the mask and the key XOR, and the message XOR with the key XOR with the mask, so you attack two intermediate results. Yes. Do you think that by considering not only two intermediate results, but maybe more than that, more, more intermediate results uh, masked with the same mask, or, or more generally more intermediate results, do you think that we can improve the attack by having a more, uh, more different uh, distributions? More, uh yeah, yes. In fact, uh, as we showed that we can attack on M, X, and Y in unmasked implementation, we can do it also on masked implementation, as long as, you said it, M, X, and Y are masked by the same mask. So we can, we can uh, if we find other variables uh, that share the mask with M, we can, we can uh, put it in the joint distributions and uh, uh, to hope that the distributions are much uh, different. But you also, by considering more points, you also add more noise. Than yes. So is there uh, some trade-off? Is there some trade-off regarding the amount of noise uh, between uh, considering more points? Um, we we show that uh, if we uh, we consider that you you get the exact point of interest because this is something uh, that is not easy. But if you get the exact uh, point of interest, it's interesting to add more points. Independently of the noise. Yes. Yes, but the X uh, for uh, variables are not, have not the same, um, I said, uh, weight of information. So uh, maybe adding some variables uh, will not be uh, very effective, but in the case of X, adding X on the attack and doing a MXY attack is a very good trade-off uh, independently of the noise. 
Okay, thank you. And maybe a very short uh, second question uh, about the uh, why do you think that the attack still apply with independent masks? Well, uh, using the joint distribution like this on, three dif on different masks uh, won't work, but we uh, maybe there is some way of using joint distributions to, to attack this scheme, but it, it, it will not be uh, the simple way of b building joint distributions and, uh, on, 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 this, uh, on these variables and, and doing something like that. We, we do not have many ideas, but maybe it's possible. It, it just, it's just uh, something that we say that must be done in the future it's if it's possible. Okay, thank you. All right, time for maybe one more question. Not all at once, huh? All right, um, I'll ask one question. Um, can this attack be applied if the power consumption model is not linear? I mean, you, you started basically by saying, right, yeah. we assume it's linear, there's an alpha, there's a beta. We yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, let me recall. Um, in fact, there are two steps. Uh, the first one is to get the amine weights. So if you have a model of consumption that is not linear, but uh, you get the amine weights, the attack applies. But uh, uh, I, I think... Uh, I think it's possible uh, if we do not get the exact timing weight, but something uh, shifted. Uh, the joint, I think the joint distribution will always be uh, different for, for each key. But the, the, the real answer is that you have to get the timing weight to, to make this attack. I see. Thank you. Thanks again, Leo. Okay, we come to the third presentation of the session. This presentation has a long title, so I can read it to you slowly while the speaker sets up the computer. Okay, the title of the presentation is Convolutional Neural Networks with Data Augmentation Against Jitter-Based Countermeasures, Profiling Attacks Without Pre-Processing. Okay, that sounds interesting. And uh, the presentation will be given by Eleonora Kali. And we're almost okay. there. We have an image. Do you have a microphone? I have a microphone? Yes. Yeah. Pointer. Very good. The door is yours. <laughs> okay, good morning. Thank you for the introduction. So first of all, a few, wor a few words about, about the author of this paper. In this picture, I present you the French certification scheme for secured components, in which me and other authors are quite involved. Indeed, Cecile works as an evaluator in a French IT security evaluation facility. I'm doing a PhD in the same val um, lab. And concerning Emmanuel, he has been in the development in the past and now works um, at the French certification body. So we have a view of these three aspects, development, evaluation, and certification. And I can say that in this work, the evaluation point of view is quite favored, justifying the fact that they are interested in performing profiling attacks, which allow us to, to perform a worst case security analysis and also the fact that we are very interested in practical aspects of setting up of the attacks. So let me introduce the context and motivate this work. Um, the bare necessity to talk about side-channel attacks is the concept of side-channel trace that will be denoted here with some random vectors x and the target z, which will be to us a cryptographic sensitive variable. And the goal of a side-channel attack is making inference over z observing uh, the traces x. So actually, the goal is well estimate this conditional probability distribution. So in case of profiling attacks, um, the profiling attacks cons consist in two phases. A profiling phase that is done using some open sample or acquiring traces under known values for the target Z, 
and an attack phase in which the attacker tried to recover the secret key on the base of its um, characterization obtained by the profiling phase. In this context today, the state of the art is the template attacks. In, te in classical template attacks, the profiling consists in estimating these probability distributions for each value of z, and the attack ba phase is based over maximum likelihood principle. So it is an approach which is known to be optimal under some informational, information theoretical point of view, but it is impractical, obstructed by at least two problematics. First of all, it is impossible to estimate these templates without performing a mandatory dimensionality reduction or selection of POEs, points of interest. And second, if traces are mm, desynchronized or misaligned, it is mandatory to manage this problem. And in particular, concerning misalignment, uh, it is known to be so annoying to treat this problem that enhancing misalignment in side channel acquisition is one of the most popular countermeasures today. And even if, in theory, it is expected to provide security only against some weak adversary, it is in practice one of the main issues for evaluators. And today, the solution to counteract misalignment is to, per um, to perform our, um, some realignment techniques. Um, and nevertheless, we remark that there is not a wide literature about um, realignment techniques, and in practice, evaluation labs have made some realignment techniques in order to fit their signal waveforms and the proprietary industrial countermeasures. So I use some this simple fly example to join with you my skepticism about the realignment preprocessing. So in this tie example, we have two misaligned traces, and we decide to realign them on the base of some easable detectable patterns, which are the peaks. So we detect the peaks, and then, for example, we decide to extract some regions of fixed size around these peaks, obtaining some cut traces, which are perfectly realigned, realigned over peaks. Now, if the informative region effectively lies um, near peaks, it's okay, we have probably extracted a lot of information from our acquisition. But if the informative region is, um, lies far from the, the falling edge of our peaks, as sometimes it happens, we have lost the greatest part of our information. And even in the favorable case in which information lies near peaks, uh, the way we detect our pattern can hide some difficulties. For example, if we detect peaks, by the means of a threshold, like the green line here, it can happen sometimes that we, mi we miss some peak and again, we lose our informative region. So obviously it is a toy example and there is many other way to, to realign traces. But what I want to say is that an evaluator can spend a lot of time in adjusting its realignment techniques, modifying parameters or basing its realignment of, on over other kinds of patterns. But the problem is that he has no prior no, uh, knowledge about which kind of patterns has some informative region, and he has no way to evaluate alone the realignment techniques without performing the afterward attack. So in practice, what we found inconvenient in the state-of-the-art template attack approach is the fact that we have two separated phases, a preprocessing phase that only aims to prepare data and the true characterization phase. And in our work, we go through the proposition of a method that tried to directly extract information without, without performing a preprocessing. And this is to, re to um, erase the risk of information loss. So we find this same end-to-end um, -end approach in the machine learning notion of classifier. And in this slide, I show you how simply a side channel attack converts into a side channel attack that uses a classifier. So if you want to do so, we start by slightly changing our vocabulary, no more talking about profiling phase, but about training phase. It's not a great deal. And then instead of estimate templates, we construct a classifier, which is a function f that will take some traces as input and that puts some scores y, which will try to be some uh, approximation of our um, goal um, uh, probability distribution. Then the attack phase holds uh, being based on the maximum likelihood principle. And concerning the desynchronization problem and the dimensionality reduction, I will we will see how in machine learning um, um, we can construct 
there are methods to construct classifier in such a way that these three steps are actually integrated in, in the, in, in the construction of such a, such a function. So in machine learning, a classifier is uh, the most direct answer to the classification problem, which is in general assigned to a datum X, a label among a set of possible labels. For example, here we want this classifier to observe this image and give us the probability for this image representing a horse, a dog, or a cat. So we want the classifier actually estimate this probability distribution. And if we change our puppy for side channel trace, we can see an analogy between these two problems. A very superficial overview of machine learning methodology, let us say that we have some tasks that are assigned to human effort. For example, the choice of the algorithm and the choice for a model. And we will see how a model um, often asked to fit some parameters by human beings, which are parameters called hyperparameters. And then some tasks are assigned to the machine, to computers, and um, which consist in automatic train the model, automatic tune the trainable parameters of the model in order to fit some data. And in this paper, we explore the class of neural networks um, trained by um, stochastic gradient descent iterative algorithm. And I will give you a brief description of two neural networks model, the multilayer perceptron, or MLP, and the convolutional neural network, or ComNet. So, and I will give you reasons why we choose convolutional neural network to treat our misalignment problem. So multilayer perceptrons are a way to construct um, classifier functions as a composition of simpler functions. Um, which are also called layers in machine learning. We always find some linear function, lambda, which are linear combination of the time samples of their input, and which depend on some matrices of trainable weights, w. Then we always find some nonlinear function and some normalizing function at the end, or on the top. And as an evolution of MLP, a convolutional neural network get born to answer to the translation invariance question, which is, if we go back to our uh, problem of recognizing the dog in this picture, oh, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, we can observe that uh, the position of the dog doesn't change the fact that he is a dog, actually. If the dog is located here or here, it is the same, and, and we would like our classifier to give us always the same answer. But it is very important to explicit this data invariance data translation invariance to our model, because if we don't do so, we risk that our model try to independently solve different problems, like um, classify a dog which is here, recognize a dog which is here, and recognize a dog which is here. So many problems for the single dog classification problem. And worst of it, we risk that our trained model is not able to well classify the same dog which is in a new position. And I see a great analogy between this translation invariance and the one we have in our side channel traces in presence of misalignment. So the question is how to explicit data translation invariance to a model and the answer given by convolutional neural network is sharing weights across space. It means that instead of use these typical linear layers that we find in, mul in multilayer perceptron and that depends on big matrices of weights that perform linear combination of all the, their inputs, in convolutional neural network we substitute these big layers from some, for some convolutional layers. Convolutional layers are still linear and they still perform some linear combination of points, but actually only locally. Uh, using some small vectors called uh, convolutional filters. In this picture, I show you four convolutional filters of size two. And then this linear um, combination are, are get slide along the trace. So this is the sharing. We use the same weights, the same linear combinations all across the trace. And we can interpret it, these filters as something, some linear constraint that gets specialized in detect some special patterns of our data. So for example, in the image case, we can, we can think of a filter that gets specialized in detect nose or ears of an animal or the eyes of an animal, etc. So 
we can remark in this picture that each time we apply a convolutional layer, we have some data expansion. Here we have an expansion of factor four because we use four convolutional filters. And that is why the second important layer of a comnet is the pooling layer that is in charge of effectuate a dimensionality reduction. So the global typical architecture of a comnet is depicted in this slide. We see that each time we apply some convolutions followed by pooling, we have the pooling layer in charge of reduce the temporal dimension of our traces and the convolution which are in charge to extract more and more features and we expect them to extract always more and more abstract features. In this structure actually our aim is to convert our temporal features which are the time samples of our trace into a list of abstract features that should represent our um, classification target. So if this structure's claim is real and works, it is by construction robust to misalignment because misalignment and other geometrical deformation are observable in the temporal domain while they are no more observable in the abstract feature domain. So we totally get rid of the misalignment problem in, in this way. And this is why we chose such a structure to attack our misalignment problem. So a few words about the training. Uh, we start training uh, by dividing our profiling set into two, tra uh, two, two sets, a training set and a validation set. Then we randomly partition the training set into batches and our optimizer algorithm will, be, um, uh, will run over batches. So we have one update of the trainable weights per process batch. And we will call epoch one pass over the entire training set which means that an epoch corresponds to a fixed number of uh, update of our weights. And this number is about the, um, the cardinality of the training set divided by the cardinality of the batches. And at the end of each epoch, it is important to evaluate and compare the accuracy of the classification we obtain on the training set and on the validation set, which are called training accuracy and validation accuracy. If these two accuracy are, are close to each other, as in this picture, then we can conclude that our model is understanding some significant feature for classification and it will be able to um, classify some new traces. But on the contrary, if we have a gap of, um, between these two accuracies, then we will understand that our model is actually learning by heart how to classify the training set and it will not be able to classify some new data as those that are contained in the validation set. So this phenomenon is called overfitting. It's a very bad phenomenon that happens mainly for two reasons. Our model is too complex or we have not enough training data. And there are many ways to treat this problem and we decide to explore the solution of data augmentation. So data augmentation is a machine learning practice that consists in artificially generate some new traces by deforming those we previously acquired, applying transformation that preserve the label. So if we have an image of a, of a dog, we deformate it and we make sure that it still represents a dog. It is to us a new data. And in the side channel context, we propose two um, data augmentation techniques, which are inspired actually by the effect of misalignment countermeasures, which means that actually in our approach, we take misaligned traces, we don't try to realign them, but we actually misalign them more uh, with our data augmentation techniques in order to provide some new data that help our comnet to learn. So these two techniques are called shifting. The first one, it consists in simply select the end region of our model by the means of a sliding window. And uh, it is parameterized by a parameter T, which gives the, the number of possible position for our sliding window. And it is to us a sort of, simul of imitation of a random delay countermeasure that uh, injects some shift in our traces. And the second, um, uh, proposed uh, technique is called add remove. It consists in um, add a fixed number of points in some randomly selected to, um, um, places of our trace and then remove the same number of points in possibly different um, places of our traces. This is to us an emulation of, the, of an hardware jitter effect that deform the clock cycles uh, patterns. It is parameterized by a parameter R, which is the number of added and removed points. So we remarked that to apply these two techniques, 
we have to tune um, two new hyperparameters, T and R. And actually, in this paper, we decided not to make any analysis uh, over the other hyperparameters. So we fixed one for all um, ComNet architecture, and we studied the benefits of these two techniques by making this new hyperparameter vary. So just a quantitative example of, uh, over our two data augmentation techniques. If we have a training trait set um, of conta that contains 10,000 traces of size uh, 1,000 points, and we apply this combination of our techniques, actually we are uh, potentially working over a training set that contains 10 to the 31 traces. So actually it is a huge data augmentation. Um, our experiments. We run experiments over three different um, data sets. And as I said, we fixed one for all the ComNet architecture, which is, which is detailed in the paper and in brief contains four convolutional layers. Um, and our implementation is based upon a, over an open source library, which is called OKRS. And I'll show you only two um, contexts for time reasons. So in the first experiment, our target was a single computation of a, of a lookup table operation um, performed by a non-protected non device. And um, as a countermeasure, we insert some random delays by the insertion of um, a random number of NOP instructions. Um, so here, actually, we see the leakage places, and it would be quite easy to extract these peaks and realign traces, but it is not the scope of this paper. We wanted to verify the soundness of our end-to-end uh, -end approach. So what we did is take the old trace containing 4,000 time samples and give it to our ComNet in order to train. So the two metrics I used to evaluate our results are a machine learning metric, which is the test accuracy. It is the classification accuracy obtained over the, the attack traces. And the N star is the more side channel um, metric, which is the minimum number of attack traces to make the guessing entropy of our attack uh, to one, so successful attack. And in this three picture, we observe the um, behavior of our the evolution of our training um, through the epochs. In case in which we have no data augmentation, so our T parameter is set to zero, we observe a huge overfitting phenomenon. And we see how augmenting our T parameters, this overfitting gap reduces. And it goes end to end with our two metrics. Um, we see how the, uh, the test accuracy augment, augmenting our T parameter and the number of required um, attack traces drops from potentially infinity to seven, seven traces. So the second experiment, um, in this experiment our target was a modern AES hardware implementation protected by a strong hardware jitter effect. So um, in this implementation we have the 16 S-box operation um, performed serially, once after the other, and to show you the effect of the jitter I, I did this thing, I computed the SNR of the first S-box operation and we see here that our SNR detects the region in which our um, operation is performed and actually the first S-box was not our target, we targeted the second one that we expect to be just after. And actually the second SN, the SNR of the second S-box should, um, showed as any uh, region of interest. So in presence of such an SNR trace, an evaluator can decide to get rid, and, uh, sorry, to give up the evaluation, to stop the evaluation, or to look for a, a realignment technique that works. But with our approach, we decided to simply select a quite large region in which we expected to, the operation be computed. So it is a region containing 2,500 points, and we give it, as, we give it to our ComNet. And as a result, we attain a successful attack without that augmentation um, using 130 traces and augmenting our data augmentation parameters. This number of um, traces dropped to 54. And moreover, we observed that actually we were in such a favorable case for a classical template attacker because we find some um, good realignment that allowed us to have some good peaks of SN SNR also for the second S-box. But we remarked that doing our best with the classical 
realignment, damage RT reduction, template attack proce um, procedure, we were anyways lightly outperformed by our ComNet approach. So it is um, a concrete case in which we see that the processing affects the optimality of the Gaussian attack. So to conclude, we pointed out um, an inconvenient of the state-of-the-art approach, which is separate a preprocessing phase from a characterization phase. We remarked that ComNet provides an integrated approach to directly extract information from rough data, and it is robust to misalignment. We can say that ComNet models ASCII actually require plenty of data to be trained. This is true. But that augmentation is a machine learning technique that answers to the lack of data. So we propose two side channel uh, adapted uh, data augmentation techniques and we verified our approach over different sets of misaligned data. So thank you very much for attention. Time for questions. Thanks for the talk. Here, here, Benedict. Benedict. <laughs> Did you try to train the network on a device and then apply the attack on traces acquired on another device? Uh, no, I didn't try. But it, it would be very interesting to try. So, And um, I believe that if the acquisition setup is the same and if the device is similar, it could be quite robust. Um, the training could be quite robust to, to resist to the change of device. It is an interesting thing to do. Thank you. I'm interested to understand um, how you came up with the, uh, the network architecture. Um, like for instance, um, the size of the pooling layers, um, whether the convolutions were strided or not, the dimensionality. Um, I'm also interested how come, uh, it seems like you only use one convolution layer per network layer. Um, any reasons? Could you elaborate on that? Uh, pardon, I, I didn't get your question. <laughs> Basically, I'm um, just curious on how you designed the network itself. Like, what was your uh, rationale for the, the structure of the convolutional network uh, that you used in this, um, this study? Okay, so actually I did it by trials, by different trials and errors. And since I wanted to fix once for all my, my architecture, I started with um, these data sets in which really I wanted to, to, to verify the, the, the data translation invariance claim. And um, I started with a few layers, less than four. Um, and I added some layers um, until I get some results. Uh, concerning the size of the filters, um, I started with some heuristics, actually. I started with filters uh, that make the size of uh, clock cycles, and then I remarked that reducing them, I still get the same results, and so I decided for complexity reason to reduce them as much as possible. So actually, that was such an heuristic work. Uh, if I may have a follow-up question. Um, did you do any pre-processing of the traces? Like, um, were you doing any centering um, or scaling by a standard deviation, anything like that? Yes, I did it. I took the whole data set and I take the average away. Um, yes, and divided by standard deviation. I did so. Thank you. All right, one more short question. Thanks for your last talk. I have a question about the... So in total, how many traces uh, do you use for the training? Because uh, if we see this doc, uh, data augmentation, you will generate new trees. Okay, actually in total, I can't see you because my data augmentation techniques are applied online. <laughs> in the sense that uh, during each epoch, I took my training traces and um, 
for each training traces, I draw some random to decide if augment the trace or use the trace that it was. And if I, de I decided to, to augment the traces, I draw the random R and T values to augment it and I augmented it. So actually it was done online uh, through many epochs. So the, the global number, like uh, 140 traces, actually the total number of traces I used including the augmented one, I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank I you. also have a short question. Um, so something that wasn't clear to me. Um, so during the training, do you need to know how the traces are misaligned to, to, to say whether this was a successful run, like whether it was a good epoch or a bad epoch? Or do you just throw the data in there? Uh, do it. you mean if I... Um, if I wonder what kind of misalignment I had? During tr do you need to know the misalignment during the training? Uh, well, I think in an optimal solution, if I um, was an expert in data science, I would fit my model uh, to, the real to, mis to the misalignment present that is present in my data. Uh, this is not what I did in my, in my work here. Uh, I just give my tr misaligned traces to my network. Okay, so you just trained for key recovery and the, the realignment is a byproduct. Yeah. It's very important, yes. of course. And I, I, monitor, I also monitored, always monitored this, uh, this evolution in order to understand if I had overfitting or not. Okay. Okay, um, if there are more questions, I guess Eleonora will be here in the coffee break and we'll take more questions. Thanks again. Thank you. Um, so the talk is about how a security feature like SGX can actually empower an attacker um, as well. So first a short explanation what SGX actually is. It is um, it's a trusted execution environment found on modern Intel CPUs. Um, it allows you to write um, user level software that is protected directly by the hardware. So you have encryption of your data and also of your um, code. And why do you do that? Because on a modern system, you have several layers, um, operating system, hypervisor, and usually if there is a um, vulnerability in any of these layers, your application will also be vulnerable. Um, if you use um, an enclave, SGX enclave, um, then the attacks from the system site will be blocked because um, the operating system and so on can no longer access your code or data. Um, so it's a good idea and Intel decided that they did not want to block or that they decided not to care about um, side channel attacks which makes it interesting for us um, and in addition of course because it protects against um, um, system level adversaries now the attacker also has system level um, powers so you can actually if you want to attack an enclave you can actually um, yeah, use, use or change the operating system that's a valid uh, option. So OS initiated attacks are powerful and um, in the last years basically we have seen a lot of attacks on SGX side channel attacks. Um, the first one showed up in 2015 where they um, ported uh, image processing into an uh, SGX enclave and when you process this picture for example uh, what you would get from page fault information look like this so you see a good relation to the um, you still see a structure of the secret data you have been processing um, 
This year we saw a lot of additional attacks um, at, at Usenix and um, also at other venues, um, including several works that use um, cache attacks, classic uh, attacks, as well as enclave to enclave attacks. Why are, um, why are cache attacks interesting? Well, um, they are very versatile and well studied. Um, because of that, we have seen um, quite a bit of updating of crypto libraries as well that have, um, yeah, increased um, the protection against these kinds of attacks. Um, why are they popular? Because they also give a very high resolution. If you compare, for example, to page fault attack, page faults give you four kilobyte of resolution um, to yeah, data accesses. Um, cache attacks actually gives you 64 bytes of resolution, so you get a higher resolution. Why cache zoom? Um, because, well, if you attack SGX, you um, you can use operating system features, and that allows you to maximize um, temporal and spatial resolution. And um, then in the next step, you can use these new, um, yeah, or this higher resolution to break implementations that have been considered um, difficult to attack before. Um, yeah, so you can also overcome certain types of countermeasures. Of course, that is not, um, you cannot attack everything. If code is really well written, if you don't have, um, if you have constant cache access profiles, then um, code is still secure. So how to cache zoom, how can we build such a tool? So the first thing is we use um, the operating system to reduce noise as much as we can. So the first thing is we fix the CPU frequency. That means uh, our cache misses will have very constant timings. And the next step, we move, um, re remove all noisy processes to a different core. So on one core, we isolate the attacker and the victim processes. Um, yeah, so we have less noise. And we can also perform a level one cache attack, which usually on a multi-core system is, is difficult to achieve, but with operating system control, it's no problem. Um, then, once we have this isolation, we can perform a classical prime and probe attack on the level one cache, and we interleave execution between um, attacker and victim. So attacker on the left, victim on the, uh, on the right have uh, shared access to a level one data cache. Um, the attacker, because, uh, has, because it has um, operating system powers, can interrupt the victim at any time. So um, we start a classical prime and probe attack. We first prime the entire cache with, with dummy data. The attacker does that. Um, once that is done, um, the victim gets to execute a few instructions, just a few instructions, as little as we can do, um, to follow closely what's going on. Then the attacker interrupts again, probes the cache lines, and here we have three cache lines where um, the victim access data and one where the victim didn't access data. And of course, when we read um, those, um, the green data again, we have a few evictions, and that means we see longer um, access times. And actually, if you look at um, if you look at it in more detail, this plot shows you um, the number of evictions we get per cache line uh, per cache set. Um, and then the number of clock cycles it takes to reload our data. And that means we can not only see if a set was accessed, but also how many lines of that set have been accessed by the victim, right? So that's actually one thing you get if you, if you, are, um, if you can reduce noise a lot and yeah, build your code fairly carefully. So uh, once um, you have read the entire cache, so you have an entire uh, data access footprint of um, the few instructions that the uh, victim executed, you, um, you uh, reprime your memory, and then the um, victim executes again. And because you interrupt so often, you also interrupt the pipeline, some of the reads will actually be the uh, ones uh, that you already saw before, because they couldn't complete the instruction, the data read instructions couldn't complete. We'll see more of that in a moment as well. So it's kind of a classical um, um, prime and probe attack, just with a very high resolution because we can interrupt the target. So if you perform a raw measurement on an empty, well, almost empty enclave, on a dummy enclave, it looks something like this. On the x-axis, we have the time or the number of observations we have. On the y-axis, we have the 64 cache lines we are monitoring. And this is a colorful plot because um, uh, basically showing the um, timing we get uh, in different colors, right? So what you might uh, be able to observe is there is some structure going on, and definitely each um, cache line has kind of a constant value that it always uh, returns. Why is that? Because um, when we switch from attacker to victim, 
um, there is a context switch, and this context switch accesses data as well, and it has basically a certain um, cache footprint that remains constant, and this is the cache footprint. Now the cache lines are on the x-axis, and the axis times are on the uh, y-axis, and this red line is our measurement threshold. If timings are higher, that means that all eight lines of a set have been evicted by the um, context switch, so we are basically blind on those lines. But on the others, as you can see, most lines are observable. And um, yeah, we can remove this offset and then we get rid of the effect of the context switch, the context switch noise, basically. So we go from a plot like this to a plot like this. And now you might be able to see what the dummy code in the enclave is, it's just reading through a table, right? So we have a tool now. Now we can try to um, attack implementations with that, crypt implementations. And we chose um, AES as a target. There are several um, software uh, or ways to implement um, AES and software um, for popular ways, uh, three popular ways we attack. Uh, one is the 4T table implementation where you have, um, yeah, four T tables. Um, each T table is a lookup table with uh, 256 entries. Um, where each lookup does um, the S-box lookup as well as part of the mixed columns operation. And uh, with the 40 tables, you basically fill the entire cache once in one way. The huge T table implementation is, has a, small, a slightly smaller memory footprint. It basically merges the 40 tables into a single table um, that you can read with an offset to get each of the for um, previous tables. So it's a very similar implementation. And then the last one is the S-Box implementation. So basically for each S-Box lookup, you just do classical S-Box lookup with a 256-byte table. Um, from a cache attacker's perspective, this is a fairly difficult implementation because 256 bytes means that your S-Box only spans four cache lines. Um, and um, you get, on average, you get about 40 accesses to each so usually we are happy if we do not see an access to a certain area of cache, then we know for sure it has not been accessed in any round. So this is really hard to attack. It's of course also slow, so usually it's not very popular. Uh, sometimes people use the S-boxes only in the first and the last round, for example. Um, yeah, but there are different, different ways to do this. Our assumptions are pretty standard. Um, the only difference is, of course, that we use cache zoom. So we assume that we have a lot of control over the operating system, which is valid if you attack an enclave. The rest is protected by the enclave, so we don't have access to um, the, um, the, uh, yeah, the code or the key. It's protected. We also assume that we know either the input or the output, as is typical for, for yeah, um, attacks on AES. This is... Um, um, Basically, the output of the um, attack, if we look at uh, T-table implementation, for T-tables implementation, and the color is added by us, so usually you wouldn't see this color. This is just to separate, to optically show where one round starts and another round ends. And as you can see, we can track um, uh, yeah, accesses to the tables pretty well. However, what you might notice is that there are a lot more accesses than you would expect. You would expect per round there are 16 accesses to the T-table, there are a lot more. But if you look carefully, you will see that um, many of these accesses that happen um, over time go to the same cache lines or cache sets. Um, and that is because, like I sa said before, that is because of processor feature features. We have out of order execution and we interrupt the, the target very uh, at a high frequency. And that means that um, while instructions can execute out of order, they might not complete. We might interrupt the pipeline and then a uh, um, load that already initiated, uh, already started, but didn't complete, will be um, executed again. And that's why we see several of these accesses. Um, then we also have blind sets. So in certain lines, you will not see any activities because, yeah, there were more than, um, because we can't see anything there. So with this information, we can now feed this um, into, into an, um, yeah, we can try to solve our equations and we follow um, prior work on that. There's work uh, by Troma et al. and by Asho Kumar et al. that describe this scenario fairly well. And if you attack plain text on, um, on an encryption, you only get four to five bits per table lookup. So you would only get 64 to 80 bits um, of the key depending on the type of implementation you are attacking. 
And what you can see in this plot is actually at what, uh, after how many uh, measurements uh, we can get the maximum amount of information, and that is typically between 15 and 20 um, samples, depending also on the implementation. So you see both um, uh, 40 tables and large t table in this plot together. Um, one thing that is important for the key recovery al algorithms is whether or not you can get the order of the accesses, right? Because um, there is four accesses per table per round. Um, if you if you know in which order they happen, you can directly map um, the information to the to the key. Uh, we tried because of the out of order execution that is difficult, but we uh, used a heuristic. We basically um, just uh, take the arithmetic mean on all accesses we see in that round to that cache line, and that's in a reasonable um, approximation of the order. And then you can actually improve your um, your key recovery rate. So here we have a success rate um, in recovering the entire information we can get, so the 64 or 80 bits on, a, uh, on an input. And if you, unfortunately, the plots are really not shown too well. If you use the order information, you succeed a little faster than uh, without using that information. But in, in all cases, you need b between, yeah, after 20 measurements, basically, you can completely recover the key, which is a lot faster than what you would get with a classical um, cache attack where you only get uh, one observation um, of, of, of the cache per um, AS run, right? Because we can interrupt, we get a lot more information. So this is, of course, an unprotected implementation, so kind of a classical target. Uh, what happens if, uh, if people try to, um, to make attacks harder? One popular countermeasure is prefetching or cache warming, where you prefetch or postfetch the entire t table either at the beginning at the end between rounds um, kind of a lot of options available um, that helps a lot basically prevents attack uh, attacks if um, as cannot be interrupted however we can interrupt as and that means we can um, attack these kind of implementations as well if you look at the trace um, you can actually see that it makes our life easier so the red part is the prefetch between two rounds in green and in blue. And um, yeah, basically it helps us separate the rounds and makes the attacks more effective. I also like this plot a lot because uh, it clearly shows the out of um, order or parallel issuing of instructions. You always see these, these groups of um, loads that we observe in one point, but the, um, the completion of these um, instructions happens in order, right? So you see the structure of the prefetch um, yeah, basically completing over time. Um, so then next we try to attack an S-Box implementation and like I said, um, there's only um, accesses to, so the S-Box lookups have only in four cache lines uh, with 16 accesses per round. Since we have out of order execution, we do not really know which access corresponds to, um, to which key byte, which makes things a little harder. So if you can't interrupt, this is usually considered more or less secure. It's very difficult to attack. Here's a trace again, where you see the S-Box happening at the bottom. If we zoom in, this is more or less what an S-Box lookup of one round looks. So um, as you can see, accesses to four cache lines, many of them not really much order in there. This is your 16 um, key bytes being, yeah, or 16, yeah state bytes being um, looked up in, uh, in the S-Box. So what do you do with this? Well, we, uh, we thought, how can we possibly attack this? Um, we made the hypothesis that the number of um, accesses we see in this plot somehow corresponds to the actual number of accesses caused by the uh, table lookups. And we checked that hypothesis, hypothesis. So what you see here is a correlation over the key byte positions. At the left, you have key byte zero. Here, you have key byte uh, 15. Um, and what you can see is that our hypothesis is correct for key byte 15 and that we basically don't see any correlation for key byte 0 and 1. Why is that? We have out of order execution but in order completion. Um, that means if you have a lookup for key byte 15 and um, it, uh, it, the lookup was successful but earlier ones have not been successful yet, it will be reloaded until all earlier um, lookups have completed. 
and that means here this one will be reloaded several times. However, for key byte zero, it doesn't have to wait for any um, um, for any earlier instructions for that round. So um, the probability that it re will result in several lookups is much lower, right? So with this heuristic, we can get um, higher rank key bytes basically much more easily, right? So later key, key bytes are easier to recover than earlier ones. So um, if you perform a, an attack on this, that means you need to find a trade-off um, between, between the number of keys you want to recover with a side channel attack and the number of keys you want um, to brute force. So we use 1500 traces just to show you the results. So this is a classical correlation attack, number of um, observed accesses correlated to the number of expected accesses caused by the one byte. And um, the yellow one is key 15. As you see, we get a fairly high correlation, clearly distinguishable from, uh, from, from false correlations. Um, but if you look, and uh, that's a yellow line, if you look at the blue line, um, the highest peak is found here. The correct key is here, somewhere in the middle, and there is no way to distinguish this, right? And a, a few additional, a few hundred additional measurements are not going to help either. So with 1500, we could recover, I think, about 80 keybits with, uh, with a high uh, reliability. Um, but the remaining one, once you either need uh, a lot more traces or you need to um, yeah, start guessing at some point. OK, so are these uh, implementations relevant? Uh, we looked at um, current at current implementations of cryptographic libraries, and you still find um, these kinds of implementations uh, quite commonly. So all uh, major um, uh, open source libraries have some form of uh, implementation of these. Both T-Table and S-Box are not um, not that uncommon. Um, yeah. So to summarize, what did you just see? Um, it's a, a cache zoom is a prime and probe um, attack on the level one cache with interrupted execution. So we can get a full cache image uh, every few instructions. And why is that? Because we can um, take, um, when attacking an enclave, you can um, modify the operating system. That gives you a lot of power. Um, as a sample target, we attacked AES. We showed that all table-based implementations um, are vulnerable. Even if you have um, yeah, weak countermeasures like the cache warming, um, if you use a, a huge table-based implementation, you only need about 20 traces compared to um, previous attacks that usually need in the order of thousands to hundreds of thousands, depending, of course, also on the scenario. And um, so maybe before I get there, just comment. Um, this is a, a sample um, target. Other ciphers um, that use table accesses will um, be similarly vulnerable, of course. Um, so side channel attacks can be very um, bad on SGX. Um, that is true, of course, unless you um, do a careful implementation. So if you ensure that execution flow and data accesses are um, um, constant, then of course you don't have anything to worry about. Um, so with that, I would like to conclude the talk. If you want to play with the tool, it's available on GitHub. Um, you can you can download and um, experiment with it. Yeah, and yeah, with that, I'll close. Thank you. Questions? Everything's clear. Um, I have. Two questions. So the first question is about um, the ordering of the lookups. So the uncertainty about the ordering of the lookups, which implies a little bit uncertainty about the keybits that you recover. So you say you can re recover up to 80 keybits. But do you know which ones they are and which, in which order they go? I mean, it's, it's one thing to know there are these 80 bits somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's a different thing to say that bit is a one. So two things. Um, so first of all, I, so you get basically you get um, four to five bits per lookup. Um, you will only get because um, at the input the keys x. Uh, you basically look. Um, you do an attack on key x or plain text if you attack the first round. But since you are 
observe different plain texts, the bits that leak, you will get the full key. That's like classical DPA. Of course, you can also, we are a chess, right? So you can also take the last round, then you don't have the boundary, but we didn't have that on the results ready in time. So the, um, the attack on the S-Box, for example, um, we attack the last round and then you can recover all um, key bits, um, there's no problem. That's basically the difference between attacking the input, where you get the XOR of message and key, you only, if, if you only leak four bits, you only leak four bits of the key because the key goes in linearly. If you attack, um, let's say, if you get the leakage on the other side of the S-Box, if you have the nonlinear function in between, even though you only get four bits of, of leakage, those four bits completely depend on all eight key bits of that byte, and then you can recover the entire key as well. So if you are in a classical scenario of attacking the encryption, uh, with a known ciphertext or a decryption with a known plaintext, then you get all key bytes. Okay. And um, regarding the last slide, so is a careful bit, bit sliced implementation a reasonable countermeasure? Um, yes, and um, yeah, maybe I should have mentioned that. I think I have. Yeah, yeah. So if you look, um, so the t-tables t tables um, is, uh, is, is vulnerable, you can't do much about it. Uh, S-Box you can fix if you look um, into all four cache lines each time, right, so for each lookup. And um, if you use ASNI or um, bit sliced implementations, you are secure, there is no question. I mean, you need to make sure that you have constant execution flow and you're fine. And constant memory accesses. Other questions for Thomas? <coughs> There's one question over there, anyone with a mic? There, behind, Amir. Um, I got a question about the assumptions that you have. You said that uh, you need uh, um, to, I mean, the attacker needs to know the plain text, right? Or the ciphertext. Or the ciphertext. So, How, like a DPA. Yeah, okay. And then um, you had also assumption that the adversary has the control over the OS yes. to, actually, yeah, to, to actually get these plain texts, probably. And if, if the adversary has the access to the OS, mm -hmm. and then we assume that the adversary gets the control over the plain text, or actually known the plain text, mm -hmm. how can we assume that the attacker does not get the key without performing okay. any attack? So, let's see. So that's basically prevented by SGX. Um, let me see. Yeah. So SGX encrypts, ensures that you, so basically it doesn't matter where you are, if you're in the little red box, your code is encrypted and your data is also encrypted. So there is um, the only place where your data shows up in plain is, is actually um, in the cache. But even as an attacker, you will not be able to access that, right? So that's, that's what you use SGX for. It's a trusted execution environment, making sure that no code except the enclave code itself um, can, can have access to that area. So you're, does it make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. But in this scenario, why the attacker knows the plaintext? If it's encrypted, if everything is coded, and then the attacker just then the control choose the ciphertext, the right? Why do you encrypt if you don't give out the ciphertext? Yeah, but you know, you should definitely know that, for instance, the code and also um, the process which is, which is uh, executed to know which part of the memory is containing plaintext or ciphertext. Um, so you can interact with the enclave, right? So en the enclave gets an input or an output and, uh, or gets an input, will produce an output at some point. So you could, for, I mean, Would depends on the offline? application. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, it's time for coffee break, and um, I've been told by the organizers that, so there's obviously coffee and cookies and so on outside, but they put the better ones upstairs in the exhibition where the sponsors are, so you should go there. Half an hour coffee break, we continue at 11.10.